Morning, Stephanie. Why don't you introduce yourself? Hi, uh, I'm Stephanie Loria. Uh, I just finished my PhD here at the Richard Gilder Graduate School um, at the American Museum of Natural History. So we are here in the Invertebrate Zoology Wet Collection, and I'm going to show you some stuff that I brought out from the collection. Uh, so uh, this is so I work on scorpions. So of course I have to show some scorpions. So this is one that I collected um, from Southeast Asia. So this is Heterometris. Um, these are burrowing scorpions. So as you can see, they can get pretty large. Uh, so if you want to see um, some fluorescence. So scorpions, um, all species fluoresce under ultraviolet light. So the way we actually uh, collect uh, these scorpions is we go out um, at night with these ultraviolet lamps, like the one I'm holding here, and we shine them around and we can see you know, the scorpions very easily because of the, the fluorescence um, on their exoskeleton. And so yeah, these species are burrowers, so the way we catch them is we can either grab them with forceps or we have to dig them out if we're unsuccessful with grabbing them with the forceps. And they're actually very quick uh, because um, scorpions, like other arthropods, they have these sensory hairs on the arms or the pedipalps of the scorpion. Uh, which is this part here, and so these hairs, uh, they're called trichobothria, and they're so sensitive that actually, um, to give you an idea of how it was, I once had a tiny scorpion here underneath my microscope, and I was up here, and you can actually see the hairs all moving with uh, my breath. So they're very sensitive, so they can, if there's an insect flying by, these scorpions can easily uh, detect, in, you know, an insect coming by, and then they're, they're just waiting there to, to grab it. So, yeah, this is a really cool one, um, heterometris. Uh, so, now I'll show you some of the more um, deadly scorpions, since uh, most people are interested in that. So, across the world, there are about um, 2,100 species of scorpions. So, this one here is uh, Androctinus. So, these are one of the, the deadliest um, scorpion species. So... Of those uh, 2,100 species, only 45 are actually considered uh, to have lethal or severe uh, venom. And this is, these are, this is one of the, the most deadliest. And so you can see here, if we compare it to the, the heterometris, that the, the pinchers here, the chela or the, of the scorpion, which is this part, are much smaller, and they have a very thick tail. So this thick tail usually is a good indicator that they have very uh, strong venom. Whereas these guys, their venom is not so bad because they actually crush their pre uh, prey with their large pedipalps. And actually, when we collect these scorpions, um, we have to separate them from smaller species that we find because what will happen is when we, um, we preserve them in ethanol, and so what they'll tend to do is they'll actually crush and break the other specimens that we collect. So we actually, when we, you know, have to, to preserve them, we have to separate them so that we, they don't destroy uh, the other samples that we get. <laughs> and, and I want to jump in with a, a question from uh, Connie Cuellar on Facebook. Thank you, sure. Connie. Uh, and, and who asks, is it true that uh, the smaller a scorpion is, the, the more poisonous it is? Uh, no. So, um, in, so one of the groups I work on, it's called Carility. And so actually some of the scorpions in that uh, group, they're actually very tiny. So they actually um, are very small. And, but the venom on those scorpions, I've actually been stung by that family. And I had no you know, reaction to the venom. It was literally the worst part was the puncture itself, and then that was it. Oh. So yes, so the reason people say that is because actually a lot of the deadly ones tend to be small, and they have these very thick tails. But there's a bit of a, a, a gestalt to the, the scorpions. So most of the ones, so all of the 45 species that are um, lethal or considered to have severe venom, they're all within one family, Buthidae. And so in the, in the Buthid family, the, the general appearance of the scorpion, they, you kind of have to have a sort of a trained eye. It's not that difficult to detect, but usually they have very thick tails. The chela tend to be small. And so generally, you know, if you get stung by something in that family, it could be, um, you know, the venom could hurt a little bit more. It won't necessarily, um, you know, kill you. And actually, even the, the species that are considered deadly, most people, even so these guys here, which are considered some of the deadliest species, if you're a healthy adult, you probably will survive the, the envenomation. It's usually children or if you um, 
have some underlying sickness, or if you're older, then you're more prone to actually dying from the envenomation. But for the most part, if you get stung by a scorpion, you'll actually be fine. And to sort of add to that, on one of the trips that I was on, so I've been stung by these corillids, you know, and so some of the species, like I said, they can be tiny. Um, but my advisor on one trip, he was stung by something in this family, Buthidae. And he, obviously he didn't die, he's alive and well, but the, he was in excruciating pain for about um, like 12 hours. And so two of his fingers were paralyzed and he just took a bunch of antihistamines. But by the next day, he could, you know, start to feel the venom sort of dissipating in his, his body. So usually if you get stung by a scorpion, you don't have to panic. You probably will survive if you're a healthy adult. So they have a, a bad reputation, but actually, you know, they're not really that bad. <laughs> Fantastic. Another question coming in from Facebook. This one from Elizabeth Alban. Thank you for, wa for watching, Elizabeth. Uh, what senses do scorpions have? And, and do they have senses that are, that are different from, from the way our senses work? So some of the senses. So one thing scorpions have, which is pretty cool, I'll show you on this. Um, this so this is unique to them. They have these um, things called pectins. And so these are uh, sensory structures on the underside of scorpions. So in general, if a male, uh, a lot of species, these pectins are sexually dimorphic. So males tend to have larger pectins and sometimes more pectinal teeth, which are actually these little um, individual segments there. And um, so what these do is they sort of sweep on the ground and they're used for detecting, um, you know, pheromones. So males can use that to find females when they want to breed. Um, so that's one sensory uh, system. Another um, are the eyes. So actually, um, the scorpions have um, basically three types of eyes. So we have this uh, dorsal eyes um, here, which are right here in the center of the, the scorpion. Um, and so these, there hasn't actually been a lot of experimental work on the role of the eyes, but some work that was done in the 1970s, I think. Can I think. actually get you to put yeah, that there sure. so we can focus um, a little better so while you're... These, these eyes are used for spatial acuity, so that's, you know, how they're used to kind of walk around. But they also have these things called the lateral eyes, and these vary in number across scorpions from um, basically um, zero to up to about seven was the highest number I found on a given specimen. And so those are thought um, to be used for some sort of um, light detection and for basically synchronizing themselves with the circadian rhythm. And by the lateral eyes, so the third type is this um, eye spot. And so and, uh, not, not all scorpions have the eye spot. So basically um, an eye spot just means that it, it, so like these have lenses, the median eyes and the lateral eyes. So they have a lens, like our eyes have a lens, whereas the eye spot, it's just sort of a, a soft region um, on the, the exoskeleton of the scorpion that is thought to be used for light detection. But again, there has been very little work actually on the functionality of the sensory, of the, set, the ocular uh, sensory systems in scorpions. Fantastic. We got a couple questions in, uh, coming in on the, the same sort of, uh, sort of vein from uh, Thayad Kifar and from uh, Stephanie Hover who asks, do scorpions kill other scorpions? And, and sort of more generally, what, what are scorpions eating and, and what, are they, what do they sort of prey on? Uh, so to answer the first question, so yes, scorpions will eat other scorpions. Um, so sort of a story behind that that I have. So I actually had um, a, so scorpions give birth to live young. So, which is cool because not a lot of people, most people think, you know, arthropods, like insects, they all lay eggs and stuff, but scorpions actually give birth. And so I got to witness this. So what happens is the female typically puts her, so the, the, basically they have it on the underside, so the babies will come out over here. And so what they'll do is they'll, if the mother's sitting like this, they'll come and crawl up on the first pair of legs here, and then they'll crawl up onto the mother's back. And they'll actually stay on the mother's um, back until about the first time that they molt or shed their skin. But once they um, leave the mother, then they are game for food. So I actually had a female, and I had her, and she gave birth. So as soon as the baby started to, you know, molt, I knew I had to get them out of there once they left her back because I knew she would consider them as prey after that point. So I had to separate her from her babies, basically. And then, of course, when I, I kept the babies, they give, um, so the brood size is actually, it depends on species, and mine maybe had about, um, 70 or so young, or between 50 and 70, 
And so I, I had the babies all in one cage, but and I couldn't now obviously separate them out into you know individual cages because you know it would just be too much maintenance. Hmm. So they they started to obviously to eat each other <laughs> over time. <laughs> so we lost a few. So the population would sort of dwindle. Um, but yes, they will eat other scorpions. But in general, uh, scorpions eat other um, arthropods. So they'll catch insects. Um, you know, they feed on you know termites. Um, basically, anything that you know will come by, and they can grab the moths, right, that are flying. Anything that they can sort of catch when they're sort of moving around on the surface or sitting and waiting in their burrows. So like these these scorpions here, so a lot of bufids, so like I said, these are burrowers, but other scorpions actually will sort of walk around on the ground and actively hunt for food. So they're not hiding, uh, they'll hide during the day, usually under rocks, because um, scorpions are nocturnal. But um, at, not, at, uh, at night then they come out and they sort of walk around to look for food. Fantastic. Um, no. You, you obviously your your specialty is scorpions, yeah. and and you studied that here, and uh, we've also got some other creatures yeah. here on the table. So let's let's talk about what else we've got here. So this is really cool. This is a scolopendra. So um, this is something actually that um, I collected. Um, so this is a centipede. So it's actually it's pretty cool. I thought since Halloween is um, coming up, so um, these guys. They also have, um, the venom is, will hurt pretty badly. Uh, so this guy's from Southeast Asia, so, but the venom will hurt pretty badly um, if you get bitten by it. So they, um, you know, scorpions will sting with their stinger, but these guys have these, um, you know, powerful fangs right there. Um, and actually, uh, I thought this was just kind of a cool story. So, so this one is, um, so Scolopendra morpha, which is the, the grouping of centipedes. So this is a centipede. Um, they a pay, some in like one of the popular science articles. They actually found that one species of this is actually can be found underwater in streams, which is really interesting. So what they this guy actually he was on his honeymoon. He was a researcher at the Natural History Museum in London, and he saw one um, you know something closely in the same group as this uh, this species here. Basically, it went underneath a, a rock in a stream, and so they um, hypothesized that actually these things at night can actually hunt, you know, um, some small, like, um, insects that are living in the stream or other arthropods. Um, so, which is, because normally these guys are terrestrial, so you often don't think that, if, you know, if you're going in a stream that you may encounter one of these, <laughs> you know, if you're... But is in the wrong spot, but they're they're pretty cool. So you, so just to, to be clear for all our viewers, yeah. there's nowhere safe from this. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not, because normally you'll find these like underneath, like uh, under a log. So typically, we, we also collect scorpions during the day, and so we roll um, logs. And so sometimes we encounter, which is probably you know how I found this guy. You know, you'll find them under the log as well. And so, yeah, you'll find them now on the, on the ground, but now you have to, at least in this one species in Southeast Asia, I think it was, it's from Thailand, um, the one that they found to be uh, semi-aquatic, where it was actually hunting things in the stream. Um, so that species is found both on land and in the streams in Thailand, which is pretty neat. But there, yeah, there's an article um, online, you can Google it. Uh, now, a question from uh, from Marco Cruz on uh, Facebook, who also described this happy guy here as his worst nightmare. <laughs> um, so, so thanks for sticking with us, Marco. Asks, uh, how long can can a, a centipede like this grow? And and maybe you can also clarify what what species is this? Um, I'm not sure. So I don't work on these guys, so I'm not sure of the of what species this is. Um, they can get actually, I mean, I don't know this species in particular, but I've seen some pretty large ones in Southeast Asia. They're like a good, a good size, you know, so they can get pretty, pretty large. So this is actually, I wouldn't say it's the largest I've seen. Um, but yeah. I, th I think a lot of viewers would argue with, with you on the, <laughs> the distance apart you were holding your hands as being a good size for centipedes to be. <laughs> Uh, but another cool thing, so um, so this is a centipede. So centipedes, um, they're you know they're arthropods too, and they're considered myriapods. And so another myriapod, which people think of, are millipedes. So the way to tell a millipede from a centipede is centipedes have one um, leg per segment, whereas uh, millipedes have two 
basically two um, leg pairs per segment. And, and so centipedes are predatory, whereas millipedes, they actually are um, detritivores, so they, they feed on decaying organic matter in the leaf litter. So these guys are kind of friendly. These guys you don't want to pick up with your hand. But these you can easily pick up with your hand, and they're, they're kind of slow moving. These are really fast. Um, these are kind of little happy guys. Uh, so this this is a cool millipede. So this is one of the more um, older groups of millipedes. So they they actually they roll in balls like this, which is pretty neat. So this is their their safety mechanism. So a lot of millipedes for defense, they will produce um, some noxious chemical that they release through their um, exoskeleton. Uh, so there's been a lot of work done where people have been identifying the compounds coming out. Of the skin. So there's actually some uh, millipedes in North America that if you pick them up, they're um, usually you find them like in the southeastern U.S. And if you pick them up, they kind of smell like almonds, and so that's sort of a you know the cyanide being produced. But we have but these guys here, their defense mechanism um, is to pretty much roll into this little ball, and they actually can lock themselves. So when this thing is alive, it's really hard to get them to sort of open up. But now you know it's preserved. Um, but yeah, they're pretty cool. And some species uh, in this group of millipedes, they actually can get pretty big as well. They can roll up to the size of a small orange. But um, spheritheres, which are you know the giant, they're called pill millipedes. Um, they're pretty much found um, in Gondwana, so you won't find them um, these large guys here anywhere in North America. But these guys um, here, these are our North American millipedes, which you can find uh, in the southeast. And what's cool about them, if you go to some places in like parts of North Carolina and you shine your UV light, you can actually see these guys fluorescing as well. And I've been to um, Highlands, North Carolina, and I went out with a UV light, and basically, I mean, the ground was just like glowing because there's so many of these millipedes hanging around. These Zistodesmids is the family. I think these are both in the genus uh, Cherokee. And, you know, they, you know, they're, I mean, it's just fantastic to see. Because no, most people, you know, they don't try to, you know, they don't come out with UV light, so they don't realize that, Millipedes in their backyards actually fluoresce really brightly, just like uh, scorpions. Um, and a question from uh, Thomas G. Steffens on Facebook, who asks, uh, when you were younger, were, were you afraid of, uh, of bugs, or what was your, what was your relationship there? Uh, I've actually, I wanted to be um, an entomologist since I was 10 years old. Um, so that's sort of when I got my interest in, in arthropods in general. I always felt that they were sort of um, underappreciated in terms of like, you know, the big mammals like elephants and lions. Those always get like all the, the media attention. But these guys actually, arthropods, you know, they, they play a huge role in the ecosystem. And, and people, you know, don't realize how important they are to have uh, around, you know, for, for the health of the ecosystem. And so like millipedes, for instance, those are feeding on decaying leaves and, the, and stuff. So they help recycle a lot of the nutrients in the forest. Um, likewise, scorpions and centipedes, right, those are predatory. They keep down insect populations. So I sort of, since um, about, you know, I was 10, so actually I'm from Queens, so I grew up <laughs> sort of far away. <laughs> I had a, you know, small little backyard outside my house, and I'd kind of would go out and sort of dig around in the soil and, <laughs> and find things, and I made like little terrariums and stuff, and I'd keep, you know, a bunch of stuff, so... I, I sort of, um, I guess because I was, like, grew up in the city, I kind of felt like I was sort of distant. You know, there wasn't, like, you'd see on, on TV, like, all the cool, like, big megafauna, like, elephants and stuff. And all I had was this little backyard with some, you know, cool little critters in the soil. And sort of that was my, my um, gateway to nature, you know, just having this little space with a bunch of neat little arthropods in it that I could, you know, get myself interested in. And, or connect myself to the, the natural world. So yeah, and so I sort of followed, you know, that track more or less all the way through till now, so. Um, Fantastic. And, yeah. and a lot of that has been right here at the museum, if, if you could, could yeah, talk a little so, bit about that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so actually I, when I was in high school, um, you know, I was very interested in biology, and but my high school program, they didn't have – it was more uh, cellular stuff. It wasn't very organismal biology, which is what I was interested in. And so I was looking for something outside of my high school um, that, you know, I could get involved with sort of learning about, you know, arthropods or sort of biodiversity, you know, the study of different species and evolution and all of that. And so the museum has this great um, after-school program. And so I found out about it um, when I was in high school. And so I 
started taking courses here. So for this high school program, what you can they have the after school program, which is where you take courses after uh, school here, and they're a lot of fun and they're great because they really it's all about you know learn. It's not so much about you know taking exams and turning in homework. It's all about the learning experience. So it's a lot of fun because you know you're really there just to learn and sort of feed your interest. And then so after I took those um, classes and I applied for the program here, and so that program the it's now uh, called the Science Research Mentoring Program. They um, basically pair up high school students with museum researchers, and you get to work alongside them for um, an entire year. And so I was paired up um, in the conservation center here, and so I um, worked on um, flamingos, actually, um, for uh, Dr. Felicity Arango. And so they had us there, help them with entering some data there. But yeah, it was a great... Uh, experience to be here in the museum. I mean, it's. I mean, we have this huge, great collection that we're in, um, and you know, it was just like a, a dream come true for <laughs> high school me. <laughs> so, so yeah. So then I I left here, and then I went to school actually in in Tennessee. I did my undergrad in Tennessee, and then but then I came back here because I found out that they started a, a graduate school, and um, I knew I wanted to. So when I was in college, I actually did some work on millipede groups, but then. Um, I found out that there, I wanted to actually work on arachnids, and so I found out there was a guy here who worked on scorpions, Lorenzo Prandini, and so I applied to the Gilder School, and uh, luckily I got in, <laughs> and so, and yeah, I've been here uh, ever since, but yeah, it's been, the, the Gilder School, or going to school here in the museum and the Gilder School is excellent, because you can take all your classes here, we have this access to this great collection, so if you want to do biodiversity or evolutionary research, I mean, it's all right here, you know, I just have to come upstairs from my office and take out the specimens that I need. And, you know, if I need to look, if I want to compare two species from different parts, usually we have it because we have such a great collection. So I don't have to, you know, send out for a loan request. I can, oftentimes I'll have what I need uh, in-house. And, you know, we have such great resources here. And, the, and you know, the school always provides a, a lot of support, um, encouraging us, you know, pushing us to help our research. Fantastic. Um, and I think we're going to take one more question sure. from, uh, from Facebook, uh, which is from, from Lisa Hollis, and, uh, is, is, who asks, is there, is there any, any bug or arachnid or sort of species that you study that you are still afraid of? And, and on the other side of that, are, do you have one that's your favorite? First question if I'm afraid of anything. Not really. I mean, I've, so I've done a lot of traveling across uh, Southeast Asia during the course of my PhD, which is a real perk of going here because they, you know, give you the support to help you, you know, do these um, collecting trips. And so I, oftentimes, you know, I'm out in the jungle at night in Southeast Asia, and Southeast Asia is notorious for having a lot of things that are, you know, have a lot of venom. Um, so I have to say, I mean, I'm not, I've been stung by wasps, I've been stung <laughs> Sung by scorpions, you know, they, um, I guess there's not, I mean, really scorpions are never my concern. Even when I'm camping, I'm never really, you know, worried about getting stung by a scorpion. I, I, well, of course, I'm looking for them, so I'm more interested in seeing them than being afraid of them. Um, so I don't think, in terms of arthropods, and there isn't really, and I mean, there's nothing I'm afraid of, because there's nothing there that can actually really... Kill you. You might be in a lot of pain, like if you get bit by the centipede or stung by a scorpion, like one of these, but you won't actually um, die from it. So, no, I'm not afraid of any um, arthropods. And my favorite, that's a tough one. <laughs> I guess, um, hmm, well, it'd have to be a scorpion. <laughs> uh, I guess the ones I work on are the group that I, um, I work on says gorillas. I don't actually have a, a s example here to show you, but those uh, scorpions are really cool. They're pre they're endemic to Southeast Asia. This family, um, they're an old group, um, and they're actually um, very interesting uh, in terms of their you know evolutionary history and um, you know. So I've learned. I guess over the course, you know, it's sort of been because I've spent so much time working on this group. I've grown to love them and. <laughs> So I, because I, you know, I know so much about them now and, um, you know, so I guess, yeah, Corillid scorpions are probably my favorite. Although these guys here, these large um, heterometrists, they're also really cool because, I mean, just to see, you know, a large scorpion like this, you know, hiding in the forest is, 
is pretty excellent. So Awesome. And for people who might have just joined us, could you maybe light that guy up one more yes. time before we let you get going? It's just fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. Stephanie, thank you so much for your time and thank for joining you. us today.